next speaker, Dr. Robert Koop, leads the artificial intelligence and machine learning team within the Digital Accelerator Group at Stanley Black & Decker. He has been working with machine learning techniques for the past 10 years and has spent the majority of this time practicing data science and leading teams within an enterprise environment. Robert also currently teaches the Georgia Tech Data Science and Analytics Bootcamp as part of the Georgia Tech Professional Education Program. In 2013, Robert earned a PhD in computer engineering from the University of Tennessee, where he focused on neural network architectures, training algorithms, and ensemble techniques. Please welcome Dr. Robert Koop. All right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about audio event detection via deep learning. Uh, so I work, uh, I run the artificial intelligence machine learning team at uh, Stanley Black & Decker. Uh, we work within the digital accelerator unit, which is focused on uh, advanced technologies, robotics, augmented reality, uh, AI, machine learning, that sort of stuff. And just uh, a little tagline, we also are always looking for talent, so feel free to, uh, to reach out. But what we'll talk about today is just a little bit of the objective of this talk and motivation, some background about working with audio data, uh, deep learning algorithms for feature extraction and other approaches, and then uh, how you augment your data and, and put the solution together. So it's important to get the objective of this talk out there. This is a, a very applied talk. The goal is to enable you guys to be able to use open source tools and pre-trained networks to quickly do audio analytics projects. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have everything you need to do audio analytics of your own. Uh, and as a warning, it, it gets uh, a little low level. There's Python source code and all sorts of fun stuff. The motivation for uh, our usage of this technology is we have a, a process that produces tens of thousands of five second audio clips every day. Uh, currently, these audio clips are all manually reviewed by humans to find events of interest. So that, as you can tell, uh, would represent millions of dollars of labor every year. So we wanted to know how we could quickly create a solution uh, in order to use AI to help cut down on this requirement. So a little bit of background just about audio in general. Uh, one very important resource that we have for audio analytics is a data set called AudioSet. So AudioSet is produced by Google using YouTube. So they've taken over 2 million YouTube videos, uh, extracted 10 seconds of audio from each video, and had a human label these videos, or label these audios rather, uh, from an ontology of over 600 uh, audio event classes. And it's a hierarchical ontology. So you might have a, a music, and then under that you might have swing music, and then even further you might have a musical instrument. Uh, so you can see a, a breakdown of some of the classes and, and amounts of each classes over there on the right. So in working with this audio, we first have to look at how we can process it and get it in a format that is friendly for deep learning. Uh, so the goal in general is to transform this stuff from the time domain over to the frequency domain. So that gives us uh, a lot of advantages. Uh, one of which is we eliminate the need for a recurrent neural network and can use just a, a standard uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, one, one aside there, uh, earlier this month uh, on, on the 2nd of October, uh, Amazon published some really interesting work about using recurrent convolutional neural networks on this. So it uh, definitely is an evolving field and, and hard to keep track of. Another thing we would do is we transform this audio from the uh, regular frequency scale into the MEL scale. So the frequency uh, that we usually think about involves the sound wave and vibrations and, and all that good stuff. The male scale is, uh, stands for the melodic scale. It is a perceptual scale, so it represents more of how humans actually distinguish audio. So the amount of uh, hertz represented by each unit of male changes as we go up the frequency because we are less sensitive to changes in noises at very high frequencies than we are in changes in noises at low frequencies. So it allows our system to process audio in a way that is more similar to how humans do. We also transform these sound waves into spectrograms. So if we see here a sound wave, 
this does not tell us a whole lot of information about what the sound is, because it's in the time domain. We can break up this sound into overlapping windows, so maybe one second windows that overlap by half a second, and convert this to the frequency domain via a Fourier transform. Uh, we then lay those windows side by side to create a spectrogram. Uh, and you can also look up the uh, short time Fourier transform for a technique of how to do this. But what we end up with is this MEL spectrogram down here at the bottom. Now the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is MEL, and the color represents the intensity of that frequency at that time. So let's see why this is important. And uh, we'll also see how well the, uh, the audio for this works, and hopefully the volume won't blow us out of the room. But uh, let's try and tell two different sounds apart. And, and these are real sounds from, from our particular process. So sound number one is this. Perhaps it's this. So I think we can distinctly say the sounds are not working. All right, did we fix it, or is it still? No, we're just the file. OK. So we have an audio presentation with no audio. But uh, <laughs> sound number one, if you'll take my word for it, is a click, a static, and, and some noises. Sound number two is a beep, a fax noise, and some sort of bang. Uh, and I'll, I'll save you the trouble of me trying to imitate these noises. But uh, in telling these apart, we notice some, some problems here. Looking at the time domain, the beginning of these sounds, uh, trust me, sound very different. Uh, however, the signal that we see is actually somewhat similar. We see a spike and then a amount of signal within a, a reasonable band that continues. However, sound number one starts with white noise. Sound number two starts with a modem sort of noise. If we look at the spectrogram, we can actually see the difference much more clearly. Uh, here at the beginning of sound one, we have a relatively even coverage of the frequency spectrum. And in sound two, we see a, a very distinct pattern here representing the amount of uh, uh, energy in each particular part of the frequency. So the spectrograms are, in general, very important for telling these things apart. So let's jump over to the world of image classification for a second and talk about the VGG network. Uh, this is a high-performing convolutional neural network that is very commonly used for image classification. Uh, one of the uh, advantages is it, uh, at first, it consistently performs very well on benchmarks. And we have several pre-trained versions of this network available. So we can download the structure of the network, which is between 11 and 19 layers and download a set of weights that had been trained on thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of images, and immediately have a system which we can use to do some pretty good image recognition right out of the box with very little effort. So from VGG, we can go to VGG-ish, which is a network that Google has created uh, using that audio set data. So the structure is incredibly similar to VGG, uh, in that we have a series of convolutional layers, max pool layers, and then at the end, some fully connected layers. One very important feature of this network, at the very end of the network, you have this 128 by one, uh, essentially bottleneck, fully, con fully connected layer. So what Google did is when they trained this network, they trained it to identify sounds as one of the uh, over 600 types of classes that they have. So after this fully connected layer was their classification layer that they used softmax to, to take the actual class label from. So what the network is doing effectively is it's taking all of the information in the male spectrogram, processing it using these convolutional filters, and then compressing it down to 128 dimensional space before using that 128 dimensions to classify as a particular class. So it's very effective. So let's look at how to use this. Uh, thankfully, in repurposing VGG-ish, uh, we have very good news. Uh, Google has released the source code as part of their uh, TensorFlow repository. So we have a, a set of files here that will really help us uh, get started quickly. So the flow of VGG-ish is first we process this audio, converting it into input frames. 
Uh, we define the structure of our network and load our checkpoint weights, feed spectrograms into the network, and then retrieve the embedding vectors. And then optionally, we can use this VGG-ish network as part of a larger neural network, in which case we would process additional layers of the network. Getting set up is incredibly simple. We just clone the repository and, and put the files on our path. So in pre-processing the audio, we have some, uh, uh, the general rule is we have very easy to use code provided for us. So we take our audio uh, loaded WAV file, uh, which I assure you sounded pretty interesting, uh, and then we can transform it into 96 by 64 frames and assuming we don't change any of the parameters, we get one frame per second of audio. So if you look down here, these five frames that we have, when put together, are the entire MEL spectrogram of the sound that we are trying to classify. So to load and execute the network uh, is very, very similar to any other TensorFlow project. Uh, we have our dependencies and we start our TensorFlow session and then we have just two lines to define this network and load our checkpoint file. And this checkpoint file is the matrix of weights that uh, were obtained after training on audio set. It's some 280-ish uh, megabytes of, uh, of weights. So we then can take our features and embedding tensors and extract them from the network. Effectively, the features tensor is the input, the embedding tensor is that 128-dimensional output, and then we just run the network. So here's what that output looks like. So we have two different ways of looking at the output. The original output is right here. Uh, there's also some pre-processing code that's provided uh, in order to maintain compatibility. So there's a, a data set, the YouTube 8M data set, which has uh, released uh, audio, video embeddings for millions of videos. So this post-processor that uh, is supplied will post-process the audio embedding into a signal that is more compatible with that data set. In general, I would not recommend doing this post-processing just because if you see the original signal is much more sparse and, and easier to work with uh, in general. So what have we done here? We've done a robust feature extraction. And the question uh, of this is, you know, why, why do this? So, VGG-ish has been trained on thousands of hours of, video, of uh, audio. And when we train that network, effectively the convolutional layers in the network are learning to respond to very basic patterns that occur in many types of audio. So these fundamental patterns occur in a lot of audio, including our specific uh, application-specific audio, even though the network never was trained on that audio to begin with. So we're using these filters to transform the audio into a more separable space. And we then can use that feature vector as input for other classifiers, such as XGBoost or even Random Forest or whatever you prefer to use. Alternatively, we can use VGG-ish as a starter network. And so what we do here is very similar. We define our structure but we just add fully connected or however, uh, whatever type of neural network layers you like onto the network. And then we define our training function, our loss function, uh, other things that are necessary to run this network code. And as we run this, we are actually training and not only the new layers that we've added on, but we're back propagating that training signal all the way through the VGG-ish network and fine tuning it uh, to very carefully uh, or very, uh, precisely identify exactly the sort of sounds that we're interested in. Uh, the trade-off here, of course, is it's going to take much more time and require much more data in order to actually fine-tune this network. So speaking of data, let's look at data augmentation. So why would we augment our data? In general, we all have the problem of limited data. That is the fundamental problem in my mind of AI. There's not enough data to do it nicely and do it easily. So we want to augment our data and effectively create more samples. This also helps prevent uh, overfitting. By manipulating this and adding noise and, and other tricks, we can help the network's ability to generalize and recognize general patterns instead of the very specific sounds it's exposed to. There are two different ways to, to augment this data, depending on where we do the transformation. We can modify the sound wave itself or we can modify the spectrogram itself. 
So here's another section that, uh, if you notice these little speakers, is going to suffer greatly from not having audio. But uh, what we can do is augment this signal with white noise. So here, if we can imagine the sound that this spectrogram makes, uh, is the original noise. And when we add some randomly, uh, normally distributed noise to that signal, we end up with this spectrogram here. And uh, if you take my word for it, it sounds very staticky. All we've done is add static to that sound. Uh, the spectrogram changes uh, somewhat drastically and is a little harder to interpret and helps our network generalize. Another common technique, or at least a technique that we found to be effective, is rolling the sound. So just taking it and shifting it in one direction or another. So here's our original spectrogram, and here is the rolled version. And if you look at the before and after, which admittedly seem fairly small on this screen, you can see all we've done is shift the entire array of sound signal in one direction or another. And uh, if you were to listen to it, effectively the sound starts in the middle of the sound and then plays through and loops back to the beginning. The last technique we'll talk about is changing the pitch. So we can adjust the pitch using uh, Librosa, gives us some nice tools to do this. And that will change uh, the entire, uh, effectively if we look at the spectrogram, it changes the location of the spectrogram without changing the shape by very much. So here is the new spectrogram. If we look at the before and after, you can see that we've effectively just raised the spectrogram up a little bit, uh, which makes sense considering our y-axis is the pitch, and we've just shifted that pitch upward. The last technique is we can change the spectrogram itself, and, and there are some, some caveats here. It can be very effective, and there are also ways that you can really mess things up. So one effective technique is just blurring this image. So we still have the same general patterns here, but the edges are less defined. We can also do things like remove certain frequencies from the image and uh, create an even greater transformation. The other two types of transformations that we played around with were rotating and scaling in space. Uh, this is where I would heavily caution you guys to perhaps not rely on this because remember, the spectrogram is in frequency space, so when we rotate it, the odds are that we have uh, created a noise that sounds drastically different than the one we started to. It's not as simple as changing the pitch was. So now that we have all that, let's look at how we put it together and, and use it in the real world. Our initial implementation had a, uh, it's as many, many companies are painfully aware, we had the high-tech solution of storing all of our sounds in a directory. And so we monitored this directory for new MP3s to appear, ran it through our listener pipeline, stored the results in Elasticsearch, and visualized it with Kibana. The listener architecture itself went through all of the steps that, uh, that I've talked about. We ingest the file, we extract the features, we use those features as input to XGBoost, and then write out to Elasticsearch. We are currently shifting this architecture over to a more scalable AWS-based architecture. So what we can do here is we've separated the model server and the bookkeeping server, which keeps track of clients and, ser and uh, authorized users and all that stuff, and they communicate via REST API. Both of those types of servers sit within auto-scaling groups and sit behind elastic load balancers. So as the load increases, we can dynamically add the number of model calculating servers that we use and dynamically uh, rotate the load between them so that it has an even load across a cluster. So to put that all together, here's what we ended up with uh, as one of our prototypes. Uh, we have here in the top left a pie chart showing the two different classes of audio that we predicted. And we were able to use uh, geocoding on the, uh, the addresses of the signals and plotted the location of signals of interest. And then in addition to that, we have just some basic uh, activity metrics and, and logs here. Uh, and this was uh, represented a, a very large increase in uh, information over what we had been using before, uh, which uh, didn't even include a map. So it's a very, very good uh, improvement. So what have we talked about? What have we learned today? Uh, we talked about VGG-ish and using it to extract features or to build more complicated networks. 
uh, and how to modify the audio signal and spectrogram in order to address audio data limitations. And then just very briefly touched about on how you might use a scalable architecture uh, via cloud services. So thank you guys for your attention. Uh, all of the sample code that uh, I presented here briefly is available on my GitHub. Uh, I caution you that the rest of my GitHub is a murky swamp of terrible code, so don't, uh, don't judge me too harshly on that. But uh, that's all I have. Thank you guys.